25 and 14. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It says, For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves or servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another one, two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Somebody say, went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents, so he multiplied. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents, but the one who had received the one talent, somebody say one talent, went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. He thought he was doing a good thing, but he was doing a bad thing with a good heart. And after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, and said, Master, you handed me over five, and see, I've made five more. His master said unto him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And the one who had two talents also came forward and said, Master, uh, you handed me two and, and I've multiplied it. I've, I've made it four. And his master said unto him, you know, that's a really good job. You, you've been faithful over the small that I gave you and I will make you, put you in charge over many things. Enter, go ahead into the joy of the Lord. And, and, and the one who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, life has been hard. All my life I had to fight. I have been disadvantaged. And this is what I knew because I know things. I knew that you were a harsh man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. I know you unfair. You're the Lord, but you don't really like me. So I was afraid. And I know y'all Bible may not read the same. And I went and I hid your talent. I hid your talent. I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. I'm giving you back what you gave to me but his master replied unto him you wicked and lazy slave you don't that sound mean you, you knew did you that I'm such an unfair God you know everything right and, and that I gather where that I where, where I did not sow or scatter so then you ought to at least invested my money with the bankers and on my return I would at least have had some interest since you know everything. That's the reading of the word. Father, we thank you today for speaking to us, for challenging us, and moving us forward. In your name we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm gonna talk to us for the next few moments from the topic, get that dirt off of me. Just, just shrug your shoulder, just clear your, your shoulder, I know, I know y'all younger people, I mean, I'm aging myself with this song, but just get that dust off your shoulder, get that dirt off of me. I'm so grateful for the children's ministry. Amen. I know there's about 40 or 50 parents that said amen, amen. We're grateful that after 23 months, our children's ministry is open again because we've been going through it. You know, bringing children in church with you is, you know, we knew parents. You know, our parents, for us, the children's ministry was right on the floor under the seat. I took plenty of naps on a pallet made under a pew. Amen. It wasn't neglect. It was just the way things were then. We, we, when the church, we had a basement in our church, and when the saints got to shopping, shouting, our nap got to bouncing. So we were wakened many times to the praise of the saints on the wood floor in the church. I'm, what I'm saying is I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. But I, I am grateful for our children's ministry. I'm, I'm grateful for, for leadership that values them receiving ministry on their level. You, you would never know this, but on our exec call, as we were talking about the reopening of the children's ministry, Pastor Lana began to share how excited she was for them to encounter God again and how concerned she was that some of them left out of the Northside Kids area in one grade level and were coming back in a whole nother classroom and all the milestones that they are. She was so concerned that she began to cry. 
And I just began to be thankful to God for a children's pastor that would be so concerned about my kids. Because Zach gets on my nerves. Praise the Lord. Can you hear me, Zach? She crying over, and I'm just glad that he's not sitting over there fussing with his mom about keeping his mask on. Every Sunday, it's a fight. Keep your mask on. So now someone else can fight while we praise the Lord. This is how I fight my battles. North side kids. It may look like I'm surrounded, but they got it during this time. Amen. And so we thank God for that. But I was raised in church that, that didn't have, we did our homework in the back during revival. We just sat in the back and tried to do math. That's why I can't add now because I was trying to add while they were singing, can't nobody do me like Jesus. And so that was how I became a, a, a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the reality is I was raised in an environment that taught me to value and make the most of what God gave me. Uh, we were a rapture-ready church. We had to be ready because he was going to come at any time. And so we lived with a sense of urgency that even though I was young, I needed to, to really uh, procure and to manage and to grow the gifts that God had given me. I was raised in an environment that gave me opportunities at a young age to express myself. I, I, I'm not an anomaly where I'm from. Everybody sings all those songs together like I do. Where I'm from, we just tie it all together because we didn't have a set list. We didn't know what we were going to sing from Sunday to Sunday. We would literally pray for five or ten minutes before service. We would come out as a worship team, and whatever song the Lord dropped on the worship leader's heart, that's what we sung that day. Now, it was chaos. It was a lot of bad notes and a lot of, a lot of uh, misinformation. We didn't have teleprompters uh, or, or words on the screen. We had uh, uh, overhead projectors. Amen. I'm aging myself. Some of y'all don't even know what a transparency is, but the lady who worked that transparency was anointed because you switch up a new song, bam, she got going up to the high places to tell the devils. She had it ready. She had it ready. That's how I was raised. I was raised in an environment that gave me opportunities at an early age. So people ask me now, do you get nervous? I'm like, well, no, I don't really get nervous because I've been doing this a long time. They're like, well, you're also really loud. I've been really loud a long time. I grew up in a church that didn't have monitors that faced this way. All our speakers went that way. So you say, I know God is a good God. Somebody in the back will shout. Yes, he is, because all our monitors face that way, but I was put in an environment that cultivated the gift of God that I carry to this day. I'm not one of those people who despised my upbringing. I loved my ch the church I was raised in. I'm doing what I'm doing now because I was given opportunities then. I, I, was, I was the one who made the church bulletin. Amen. I stayed up on Saturday nights making sure all the announcements were in there and they all ended with now govern yourselves accordingly. Because we didn't have Instagram and we didn't have text message reminders. And if you forgot the revival was on Tuesday night, that's your fault. Bishop Iona Locker's going to be here Wednesday night. You can show up if you want to and be late if you want to. But I promise you there's going to be a crowd. There was an enthusiasm about being in the house of God. You couldn't announce revival and people decide to stay home. You couldn't announce revival and people prioritize other things. And revivals did not have an end date. All the flyers I made in my team said, starting on. Because when it ends, it's up to the Holy Ghost. And in fact, the bulletins I made had asterisks in it that said, this is the order of service. But there was an asterisk that said, it's subject to change by the leading of the Holy Ghost. And even though we're a modern church, one thing I appreciate about the Potter's House of North Dallas is you don't know how this thing is going to go. Because if God decides to move in on a song or an exhortation or if the pastor gets up to take up offering and that's where God's glory resides, we're going to stay right where the glory resides. But something about this upbringing gave me a passion for the house of God. I don't, I don't get tired of church. I, I, I'm energized in this environment. Three hours later, when Bishop goes into that third gear, that third dimension, and is prophesying, I'm right here with him because I was raised in the fire, and I am strengthened in the fire. I am energized by what zaps other people. 
because I was raised in an environment that gave me opportunities. It taught me to cherish and to value the gift of God that was on my life. First, it taught me that I had a gift, that I didn't need to live my life any old kind of way, that I needed to have an honorable reputation, that I needed to be a person of integrity. I, I didn't grow up in a church with a whole lot of scandals. The, the people that I was raised around, they weren't famous, but they were faithful. I said they weren't famous, but they were faithful. People ask me, what church did you come from? You would never know the name of it, but without knowing the name of it, just know that the saints that were a part of that church knew how to serve God in the army of the Lord until the very day that they died. They knew that we had been given his talent. We had been given his gift. We had been given his treasure. And we had a treasure in earthen vessel. We had a divine treasure in a carnal thing. We had a holy thing in an unholy thing. So I had to be very careful how I behaved myself even at school. I had to be careful of how I behaved myself even when I tried to play football for two years. It was the hardest two seasons of my life. I drank a lot of Gatorade and didn't get in the game much because I wasn't physically coordinated. It, but I, I had to be sanctified even in the locker room. It didn't mean that I was weird. It didn't mean that I didn't associate with people. I am a person who was both the class president and the valedictorian of my class. I was popular enough to be the class president, but smart enough to be the valedictorian. I'm telling you, you could be young but not have to compromise. I still had a great time in high school. I wasn't drunk, I wasn't crazy, but I was cool enough. And I got a teacher right now, Miss Edna Farmer. She says, and even the thugs respected him. I don't know where she got that from, but even the thugs, even the people that were less likely, I had a way of connecting with everybody. And I was still sanctified. But I was taught that I had a gift. And so we are, are talking today about a, 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 a parable found in the book of Matthew. In the 25th chapter, there, there are three parables in this book. For those of you who don't know what a parable is, a parable is a short story that illustrates a moral attribute or religious principle. I know most of y'all know this. This is my Sunday school portion. Parables are generalizable uh, and they contain cross-cultural and multi-generational timeless truth. But but because they don't uh, uh, name a particular person, uh, the good thing about a parable is they could be uh, uh, applied to anybody. And, and we can all receive information from a parable. We can receive the grace in a parable, and we can also receive the judgment or the warning in a parable. And so the book of Matthew, the 25th chapter, contains three parables. The first one is the parable of the ten bridesmaids. It's, it's their it, ten uh, virgin bridesmaids. They're, they're five wise and they're five foolish virgins. And, and, and the thing that I learned from that parable is you can be sincere and stupid at the same time. You can be purely off. It can all happen at the same time. You can, be, you can be pure. You can be dedicated. You can be committed. You can be spotless. You can be untouched and still be foolish. The other thing I learned from that parable, because what happens is that they, they're waiting for the bridegroom to come, and so they all have lamps, and there's a certain hour that, that, that the foolish virgins run out of oil, and so they're asking the wise virgins for the reserve oil that they brought with them. The other thing that I learned from that parable is that in this season, you're going to have to have your own stuff. I know that many of you were raised off grandmama's prayers and you love the prayers of the pastors and the prayers of the righteous, but, but, but in this season, in these last two years, we've had to learn how to pray for our own self. Got to learn how to wipe the tears from your own eyes and slap your own forehead, fall out and pick your own stuff up back again because when depression is trying to consume you in the midnight hour, you're not going to have a worship team and you're not going to have a Pastor Brady. And even though you can scroll down Instagram and see some inspirational videos, there's going to come an hour when you're going to have to have your own stuff. I need you to shout out in this room, I got my own stuff. I got my own oil. I got my own anointing. I got my own calling. Pray for me if you want to, but if you decide not to pray for me, I have learned how to pray for myself. Invite me to dinner if you want to, but if you don't invite me to dinner, I can cook my own food. I'll make my own Thanksgiving dinner, then sit across the table and deal with your toxicity. I don't need to eat all that pork and fat and hog malls anyway, so I will cook my own holiday dinner. I will take my 
my own self out on a date because I got my own money. Don't think you're going to buy me and get all the best of me out of me. I got my own stuff. Girl, you better have your own stuff in this season so them little trinkets and cash apps don't talk you out of the gift that God has placed in your life. I got my own stuff. I got my own business. If this business goes under, that's fine. I know how to be a consultant. I know how to work in different places. I got my own stuff. There are seasons in your life where everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And when that day comes, you better have some reserve of your own on the inside so that if the bank decides not to finance, I got my own money. If you decide you don't want to love me anymore, I know how to love myself. I got my own stuff. Stop trying to impress people and suck up to people and be their favorite friend and only say things that they like and only do things that they like. I, I, I know how to do this by myself. There's another story at the end of Matthew 25. It's about the sheep and the goats and, and the final judgment. And, and, and he says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. And they asked, when did I do these things? And, and the master replies to them, as you've done it for the least of them, you've done it for me. And so that's our reminder to stay committed to serving others. Amen. That's our reminder that we secure our seat in the kingdom of God, not by becoming wealthy. It's not how much you can get. It's how much you can give. It's not how much you can accumulate. It's how much you can distribute. Amen. And so I've asked God to make me a distribution center of wealth. Make me a person that's trustworthy. Make me a person that you can depend on. If you give it to me, you can get it through me. I won't hold it. I won't stop this, this law of reciprocity that's in the earth. That, that, that whatever I sow, that, that shall I reap. And, and so those, those parables kind of sandwich in between this parable of the talents in Matthew 25, uh, uh, 14 through 28. And, and, and so, so it's, it's where we, we find our text for today and and it's really a story that Jesus told that I have not been able to get away from since about last October. I've been looking into this parable of the talents because I felt like God was provoking me to multiply. Somebody say multiply. God was provoking me to make more out of what he put in me than what I was currently making out of it because God at his heart is an agriculturalist. God at his heart is a farmer. God, God operates as long as the earth remains seed time and harvest. It, it just happens. And so there's a part of him that is very interested in your ability to multiply. So Dr. Miles Monroe taught us that, that we should die empty, but I, I want to add to that a little bit. I don't, I don't just want to die empty. I want to die multiplied. I want that the things that I'm carrying to have, have, have touched so many people, the, the, the things the, the, that God has placed in me to multiply. And, and so what you have to, uh, uh, there, were, there were three dividends of talents given out and, 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 and two people that were given more did more. And the one man that was given less did less. He didn't produce. The ones that produced and multiplied were called faithful. They were rewarded. The ones that didn't produce were, was called wicked and lazy. The first nugget I want to share with you from this parable is simply this. Never underestimate the value of community. There's a reason why we are part of this local church. There's a reason why we have support groups. There's a reason why we have interest groups for men and women. Our hope as a pastoral team is always that our programmatic ideas match your needs. But sometimes if our ideas don't match your needs, you just got to pull yourself up to the table and say, I'm going to be a part of community. Because for some reason, the person with five talents and two talents knew exactly what to do, even though they weren't given instruction. But this one talent man did not know what to do. And sometimes you got to follow people that are doing the right thing until you learn how to do the right thing yourself. So don't underestimate the value of community. Sometimes you gotta watch a woman be a good wife because you've never seen it before. You got to watch somebody that's a good cook. You gotta learn the value of apprenticeship and community. You got to be around wiser, older people that have already been there and done that. You got to surround yourself with community. 
because the world doesn't necessarily work the way you think it does. And so this one talent man has isolated himself and unintentionally made a mistake. Uh, but you have to value what God gave you. So that's the second thing I want to share. First, don't underestimate the power of community. Secondly, value what God gave you. B -b because this talent here is not necessarily singing. And I love good singing. And this talent here is not necessarily intelligence. And I love intelligence. This talent is not the ability to make a quilt. But this talent is, that's why different translations place it and interpret it differently because it's seen as a commodity. Uh, it's estimated to be about four hundred to six hundred thousand dollars in today's currency. So even though he was given one talent, he was still given wealth, but he didn't value it. He had one opportunity, but for some of us, for many of us, I don't care if you're a millionaire. Somebody give you $600,000, you'll find a way to make something of it. But I want to go a little deeper because this word talent doesn't just have a fiscal interpretation. There's also this implication that this talent is a weight. Come on. So when the master gives this man talent, he, he places his weight on him. Come on, he gives him a measurement. That, that, that same weight could be interpreted kabod, like, like the weight of God's glory. And so even though God gives us different dimensions and dividends of his gifting, when we get God, we get all of him. I said, when you get God, you get all of God. And so God has placed his weight on you. Never underestimate the value of God's weight in your life, W-E-I-G-H-T, his weight on you. God put his weight on this man, but this man didn't see any value in it. And so when God decides to put his weight on us, we have to walk with a certain authority. We have to walk with a certain power. We have to walk with a certain knowing that when I walk in a room, it's not just me and my pounds and my smile. It's not just me and my personality, but when I walk in the room I'm carrying the whole weight of God in the room with me that's why when I come into a room the whole room has to shift because I didn't walk in here by myself I walked in here carrying weight He's carrying weight but he doesn't know it carrying weight but he doesn't appraise it appropriately and because he doesn't appraise it appropriately, he can't appreciate it properly. Because when you don't uh, ascribe the right value to a thing, you will un inevitably mishandle that that you devalue. I don't want you to take the Potter's House of North Dallas for granted. There's a weight on this house. When Pastor Brady opens her mouth, there's a weight on her voice. When Pastor Travis preaches, there's a weight on his voice. And you can't ever underestimate the value of weight in your life. I know sometimes it feels heavy. And I know sometimes it feels like a burden. But you've got to learn how to get under the weight and keep it moving. We're in a series called Moving Forward. And when we as a team thought about this topic, we said to ourselves, we wanted to answer the questions, who am I? Where am I? Where am I going? What is my assignment? And how will I get there? What will it take for me to get there? I'll, I'll give you those questions again because I want you to write them down if you're taking notes. Where am I? Sorry, number one, who am I? Two, where am I? Three, where am I going? What's my assignment? And what will it take for me to be there? Pastor Travis began by telling us in order to understand the answer to any of these questions, we have to remember that, that, that it, is, it is the life of Paul and Timothy that, that teach us how to remember. Paul was um, doing his best to put Timothy in remembrance of his childhood just like I did today. I remember where I have been and what 
impact it had on my life and how it shaped me into the person that I am. And then last week, Pastor Brady talked about Hannah. Can we clap our hands for, for everything shifts at Shiloh? She, she talked about Hannah and, and how Hannah's, uh, 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 her barrenness turned into a, a prayer place. And today, I'm going to talk to us about this one talent man. I'm going to call him for the sake of being short, Mr. OTM, Mr. One Talent Man, Mr. OTM. You see, they all, and I was asking God, how do these stories, these texts align with each other? And I want you to know that I am not a person who will violate scripture. And so normally I wouldn't compare and contrast these people together, but for the sake of moving forward, I, I just want to paint a picture for you. Paul had a physical limitation. He, he was uh, in prison, and, and because his limitation was, was manifested in prison, that means that he was judged by the legal system and, and, and Hannah she had a physiological limitation or some would even say a gynecological limitation and it was manifested in barrenness and so she was judged by society and ostracized from being be, being a mother because in that day as pastor taught us that if you didn't bear children your worth was diminished and so Mr. OTM he has a psychological limitation so Paul and Timothy had a physical limitation Hannah had a physiological limitation but Mr. OTM had a psychological limitation it, it manifested itself in narrow mindedness and lethargy and while Paul had been judged by the legal system and Hannah had been judged by society Mr. OTM was judged divinely and he was called wicked because if you have the opportunity to make more out of your situation and you choose not to God calls that wickedness Paul would have loved to have the opportunity to walk freely. And Hannah would have loved the opportunity to be able to produce. But this man had nothing but space and opportunity. But he didn't make the most of his opportunity. And he's called wicked and lazy. And he's punished for the offense of mismanagement. <laughs> Hannah wanted to multiply and couldn't. Paul from prison was able to establish the church and he had a thorn in his side. Hannah had barrenness. I want you to know everybody got something they're working through. You ain't gonna have any excuse to give to God just because he didn't give you five or two talents don't mean you're excused from multiplying, 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 multiplying. I have an obligation for multiplication. There's an obligation for multiplication. His offense is worse than that of barrenness. His offense is worse than, than being confined to prison by the legal system. His offense is an internal deception. Hannah's limitation was physiological. She wished she could change it, but she couldn't. Paul, Paul was in prison. He wished he could get out, but he couldn't. But, but Mr. OTM was locked up in his own mind. This one talent man, Mr. OTM, teaches us a very valuable lesson. And at first, I felt a little sorry for him because he did not get what everyone else in the text got. But, but, but one thing he did get that they all got, and that was an opportunity. Uh, that was an opportunity, but it's what he chose to do with his opportunity that determined his fate. I don't know how Jesus knew 2,000 years ago that he could tell one story and I would find a space in it to, to diagnose this current society. We're living in a self-centered and self-focused society, a selfie culture. We're in a selfie culture. This man was focused on preserving himself. He was focused on saving himself. He was focused on his own righteousness. And so I see tucked in this ancient text of an hypothetical narrative a parable that Jesus described people at that time but but I see a few of us in this story today because there's a problem when you become absorbed with self there's a problem when you become consumed with self when you, when you become self-righteous when you become convinced that the way you do things is right just because you did it when you become convinced that the world works 
this certain way just because you said it works that way and she's so convinced that, that you know how the world works that when the master himself appears to find out what you did with what he gave you you're telling the God of that created the universe how things work and you're telling God all your excuses and you're telling God that he didn't treat you fairly and you're telling God that I lost my mother you're telling God that I grew up without a daddy in the home you're telling God I was raised in poverty and you're making all the excuses I was never loved like I needed to be loved but everybody has something they have to fight and when you are self-righteous nobody can tell you you're wrong because you made an idol out of your own opinion This man has become so intoxicated and indoctrinated and convinced and persuaded that his perspective is right, that he's become blind to the possibility that he could do things differently. The master was gone for a long time. You could have asked five talent or two talent along the way. What have you been doing while the master is gone? But you're so convinced that the way you're doing this is right. You're worshiping at the altar of your own intellect and you're preparing your yourself for a harvest of letdowns so you talk but you don't listen you're in a conversation but it's really not a conversation you're just being quiet long enough to have your turn to speak because you already know how this goes you know everything you, you, you you're convinced that that to play it safe is the right way to go but but baby my fear for you is that by the time you realize that your operating system is outdated it will have become too late that that you are in by the time you are informed of your erroneous logic that your knees would have weakened and your back would have bowed and your eyes would have started to dim. I don't want you to be guilty of having a right revelation at the wrong time because when, when he finally catches the revelation that there was more to do, time has gotten away from him. But you can't afford to waste the strength and vitality of your life convinced that the system is set up against you and you're stuck but you don't know it. You've been deceived by your own self and you're you're convinced that you can do tomorrow what God is challenging you to do today. Self-righteous, self-righteous, self righteous you you think you're raising these children right you, you you think you're doing the right thing in your home you you've convinced yourself that you're working your job to the best of your ability <laughs> and others are being promoted for other reasons but 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 you, you you think you're the wife that he needs or the husband that she needs and you won't ask anybody for help you're driving your whole family into a ditch and can't even fully worship God because you're secretly a narcissist I'm sorry I want to encourage you but I have to tell you about yourself first and even though your worship is secretly about you I want you to know if you ever have never looked at yourself in the mirror after worshiping God and didn't recognize yourself you ain't never really praised him you can't praise God to be God focused and self-centered at the same time if you ain't never had to leave out of church and wondered how your makeup ran all down your face and wonder how your clothes came untucked, you ain't never really let yourself go in the presence of God. David said, I'll become even more undignified than this. If you think that you've seen me praise God before, you ain't seen nothing yet. And I'm telling you, you'll never get into real worship if you stay focused on yourself. Song said, let's forget about ourselves. Hey, child. And concentrate on him and worship him. Your problems are enough for you to dig in the ground and bury it. Your problems are big enough for you to not want to move forward. But the old saints also said, you got to run while the blood is running warm in your veins. You're not as young as you think you are. You don't have as much time as you think you have. This pandemic hasn't taught us anything. It's taught us the fragility of life and the need to urgently fulfill what God has placed and set before us. You're waiting on a moment that will never come because you're self-righteous. Another crime that I saw this Mr. OTM convicted of was self-sabotage. He was self-righteous. 
which led him to become self-sabotaging, which is actively or passively taking steps to prevent ourselves from reaching our goals. It, it doesn't always happen on purpose, but, but it happens sometimes in our subconscious. I would rather take myself out of the fight than to try to fight and lose. At least I can brace myself for the, loo the loss I know is coming. I, I can brace myself for what I can control. But before I give you a chance to walk away from me, I'll cut you off. I'll make up a reason to fight. We don't really have to be into it, but I'll just, you know how to, you know how y'all do. I'm not going to call any genders or any roles, but you know how y'all do. I'll just make up a fight. I'll, I'll just, I just feel like fighting today. I don't know why. I just feel like fighting today. I woke up and I wanted to fight. I'll tell other people that it was just to see how you would respond. But in reality, the truth about me makes me so uncomfortable that I can't imagine how anyone else would want to be around me. So I'll provoke an argument to make you feel externally what I feel internally about myself. I'm going to provoke a fight to make the home uncomfortable. I'm going to put so much tension in the air that when the children come home from school, they won't want to laugh and play, but they'll want to sit quietly because there's so much tension in this home. And the reason there's tension is not because the devil is busy, but is it because you're self-sabotaging. You'll injure yourself or cut yourself or harm yourself to, to make your body feel what your emotions feel. You're self-sabotaging partly because we want control so by accepting a negative outcome ahead of time we feel like we're in control even if it's not really what we want it to happen I'll just brace I'll just fall myself then let you knock me out I'll, I will disappoint myself so you can't disappoint me I will hurt myself so you can't hurt me I will kill myself so you can't kill me and even though some of us are not completely suicidal many of us are murdering our potential because we are self sabotaging ourselves and refusing to get in the fight we self-sabotage because of the fear of failure. I don't want to give it my all and still not be good enough. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to try and fail. So because I'm so afraid of failure, I'll stay out of the fight. We self-sabotage because of our inner critic. I don't need you to criticize me because my inner critic has already done the job. So by the time I hear criticism, the reason why you respond with such vitriol is because you've already talked yourself into a ditch before that other person ever told you they didn't like the lasagna. What you mean you don't like my lasagna? This is my mama's potato salad. What you mean this house not clean enough? What do you mean I'm not a good father? What do you mean I'm not present enough for my children? What do you mean you don't like my hair? What are you doing cutting me off in traffic? And because the inner critic in you has spoken so loud, any external criticism feels like an unbearable weight. You tell yourself I'm here, but I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve this family. I, I don't deserve these kids. I don't deserve this job. I don't need a seat at this table. You're physically present, but you're mentally absent. You're somewhere else in your mind because even looking at your family where you thought you would finally feel acceptance, you feel like an outsider. You're sitting at the table watching people laugh and you don't feel like you're ever in on the joke. And, and so I'll sabotage it. I'll throw a wrench in it. I will ruin it so you won't have the possibility to ruin it for me. I can't take this anymore. So I'll just murder my potential. I'll hide my harvest in the dirt because I don't like to lose. And even though Pastor Brady taught us we had to stay in the fight, I really don't want to fight anymore. I'm an imposter. I'm a fraud. I'm a sham. I don't belong. And after all, I've only got one talent. God was generous to everybody else, but he was stingy with me. I'm comparing myself to filtered pictures of other families on Instagram and social media. Listen, don't let those Christmas card photos fool you. Every family is going through something. 
I don't care what their stories and their reels reveal. The reality is there are no perfect families because there are no perfect people. There is no perfect church because there are no perfect families. There is no perfect community because there are no perfect churches. We are all trying to work through something, but I want you to know that you are worthy because God said you are. You are accepted because God said you are. You are brilliant. You bring value. You are tenacious. Your ideas are indispensable. Your contribution to the world is immeasurable. This is your morning affirmation. You are worthy. You are loved. You are safe and you are necessary. You have what it takes. You are not a mistake. I don't care what your mama said. You are loved and you are you have purpose and you make people better not worse. Your business will succeed. Your dreams will flourish. Good things are happening for you. Good things are happening for you. I came to tell you this morning you are surrounded by the right people. Your opportunities are blessed. Your finances are blessed. Your children are blessed. Everything connected to you is blessed. Your presence provokes positivity. Abundance, peace, wealth, and happiness and success all flow through you. Thank you, DJ. You're on the brink of entering into one of the greatest seasons of your life. Expect good things. Expect good news to hit your phone. I said expect good news to hit your phone. The Lord is with you. You got to start telling yourself that. When that self-critic is trying to tell you, you don't deserve this family, but the Lord is with me. I may not be the mother I should, but the Lord is with me. I may not be the father I should be, but the Lord is with me. I may not make all the right decisions, but the Lord is with me. I need you to scream it as loud as you can. The Lord is with me. Pastor Brady said it earlier, he's Shama, he's with you. And you've got to stop telling yourself and sabotaging yourself by convincing yourself that you're in this by yourself. You are not in this alone. So even if you don't deserve it, he put his weight on you and made you worthy. The Lord is with me. 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 They think it's cancer, but the Lord is with me. He wants a divorce, but the Lord is with me. They're closing the business, but the Lord is with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because... Take all the scans you need to take. Run all the tests you need to run. Ask for all the opinions you need to ask for. But at the end of the day, doctor, the Lord is with me. Please be seated. The Lord is with me. That's why I didn't give up, because the Lord is with me. My, my, my life may not be worth living, but the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. I don't know if it's going to get better or worse, but, but the Lord is with me. I don't know how this business deal is going to work out, but the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is with me. See, see what the enemy knows is that he can form the weapon but it won't prosper he knows that no weapon according to isaiah no weapon formed against you shall prosper so what he secretly tries to do is turn you into the weapon if i can't make them if i can't make a weapon strong enough to take them out i'll convert them into a weapon and so instead of using their words to build up their family, no, this marriage isn't what I want, but it's going to get better. Instead of using their words to build up their children, he's not as smart as I thought he would be, but baby, you're not that smart either. So just tell them, I couldn't do math either, but we're going to make it in Jesus' name. Listen, instead of using your words to build, instead of using your hands to multiply, you will unintentionally use your hands to destroy because if he can't, Form a prosperous weapon. He'll taint your thoughts until you self-destruct. He doesn't wait till you get 30 or 40 to start impregnating you with self-doubt. He starts at a very young age. He starts telling you things 
through your peers and through your friends and having them tell you sometimes it's like, how did you know that's my worst fear about myself? Uh, you'll find yourself in an argument. Now, one thing I was very good at and I still do it today. I mean, I tried not to because I'm sanctified and I'm a pastor, but I can really talk about people. I've probably never been in a physical fight in my life, but I could talk you down till you start crying. I promise you I can. Oh, you're so nice. This is the sanctified version of me. This is the redeemed part of me. I can cut you so fast that you're standing there whole and don't start sliding apart till 10 seconds later. You don't even know you've been cut. And then I got a prophetic gift so I can see why you're doing this. That at your core is a violation. So I had to pray really hard. God, redeem my mind, redeem my mind, redeem my mind. Because the enemy knows how to plant seeds for your destruction in an early stage. I don't know who I'm talking to, but there are about 30 or 40, maybe 100 people in here who had to fight as a child when you should have just been able to play. You had to fight when you should have been able to play. So instead of learning how to enjoy life, all you know how to do is engage in warfare. You, you just fight all the time. My, my grandmother would call you cantankerous. You're just cantankerous. Like, Granny, what that mean? It mean cantankerous? Just full of fight, full of venom. Full of, full of it, it, it comes out. When, as soon as you're touched, it comes out. And it usually starts at a young age. So, so I talked about self-righteousness and, and I talked about self-sabotage, but I also saw another word that starts with S and I didn't even intend it like this, Bishop, but another word that starts with S and I, I, I didn't see it explicitly in the text, but I was talking to Pastor Travis one day and I told you I've been dealing with this parable since October and I said, what, what if this man is dealing with shame? He's been given a great opportunity, but his mind is full of shame. Well, I don't see shame mentioned in that text. I don't see it either, but, but I, 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 I want to take us on a journey, if I could, if we could just dig a little deeper in, into his story, because it's easy to assume that the giver of gifts gives good gifts only, the way we define good gifts. That every good and perfect gift that comes from God is wrapped up in a bow that makes us like it. But what if God decides to put his weight on us in a way that we wouldn't describe as good? In, in Kay's way, grief and loss, we, we teach the people that grief is a gift. And, and there, there are people that sometimes come into our course and resist that phrase because grief doesn't feel like a gift. The, you mean to tell me the, I'm not telling you it's the Merry Christmas, Happy Birthday kind of gift. I'm not trying to tell you that it's got a big red bow on it, that you're going to run out of the garage and see the, the, this dream car gift called grief, but, but what if, if this man is dealing with shame because the gift he received came in the form of trauma? What if this man's talent was multiplied trauma? And so what do any of us do when we've had to be given and dealt trauma at an early stage in our lives? We hide it. So instead of being able to live our life multiplied, and live our life productive, instead of being able to move forward, we hide what God gave us in the dirt. Because I don't want to make any more bad things happen in my life. And when you come asking me what I did with this mess you gave me, I'm going to give it right back to you. But God gave him something that he never asked for. He never asked to be put in this position. He never asked to have to raise this kind of family. He never asked to have to bury this many relatives. He never asked to be touched in this way. He never asked to be violated at an early age. And God gave him an opportunity to multiply 
and he hid it. Because anytime you go through anything that makes you sad, you don't want to get up and tell anybody about the abortion. Giving honor to God for all these divorces that I've had and all of this money that I lost and all of these bad things. We don't get up and test. I was taught as a child how to have testimony service, but nobody wants to stand up on the fifth row on the third seat and say, I want to thank God for taking my mama. But everybody has something to work through. And this man could not uh, accept and really manifest his full potential because he would rather hide it than have it see the light of day. I would rather you think I have it all together than to let you know that I'm, I'm traumatized because even if his, his talent wasn't grief and even if his talent wasn't trauma, at the very least, this one talent man was disadvantaged when it came to his peers and so he could have lived his whole life in comparison. And so instead of you being able to make fun of my one thing, I will throw dirt on my talent. But that's the problem. It's not your talent. Is his talent. And some kind of way in between the tears and the therapist couch, you've got to find a way to get that dirt off your gift. Anybody that's going to do anything great for God, the devil would love to submerge it in dirt because people won't receive you dirty. So I would rather put a scandal out about you or introduce an insecurity to you at a young age so that by the time you get a platform, there's so much dirt on you, nobody wants to receive you. I would rather taint your perspective of marriage and family such that you always destroy what I gave you by throwing dirt on it because of the way you were handled as a child. I'm ashamed of the way that God chose. What do you do when you're ashamed of the way that God chose to move in your life? Everybody wants to sing and everybody wants to preach and everybody wants to prophesy. But what do you do when you don't find pleasure in the way that God chose to use you? Made you a first partaker of violation so you could tell another violated little girl that you don't have to live your life broken. I didn't want to go through that. I, I didn't want to go through that. But when I saw Cheryl Jackson post that she had a heart issue, my heart went out to her because I've been dealing with one for 12 years. And, and, and God has to sometimes make us a first partaker of pain so that when somebody else goes through what we went through, we're able to tell them, I know the Lord. Yeah. We'll make a way. I didn't learn this in a book and I didn't learn this in a course, but through the experience of my life, I have learned how to trust and depend on God. I've learned how to be depressed, but praise him anyway. I've learned how to be broke, but praise him anyway. I've learned how to go through things and not look like what I've been through. I've learned to call him holy even when I feel like hell. I've learned to call him faithful even when I'm fearful. And I've learned it because of the things that I've been through. And even though this man was given a talent that he didn't want to share with the world, God is telling me to tell somebody in this room, you're going to have to get that dirt off your gift. He's not going to do it for you. You're going to have to get that dirt off of you. Yes, sir. Because hiding is comfortable uh, and hiding is safe uh, and hiding is convenient. Uh, but anybody that wants to be great uh, is going to have to deal with the dirt. Uh, what is dirt, Joseph? Uh, dirt is what man, God made man out of. Uh, when he got ready to make man, uh, he formed us from the dust of the earth. Uh, and so if you're going to multiply in this season, you're going to have to get that flesh off your gift. 
You're going to have to become what God wants you to become. He's Job in the Bible. Somebody say Job. Job in the Old Testament was faithful. And God was bragging on Job and saying, yeah, he trusts me. And yes, he's dedicated. But the devil said, you've got this hedge of protection all around him. So the devil said, remove the hedge and let me throw some dirt on him and see will you praise him dirty and see will you praise him when things aren't going right but what Job knew that the devil didn't know yet is that it wasn't the head but it was what's in his heart I wonder is there anybody in here that knows it's not the head but it's what's in my heart it's not what's around me it's not what's on the fringe, but it's what's on the inside. I love my family. God knows I do, but it's not my head. It's what's in my heart. I love my job. God knows I do, but that's just the head. If I lose this job, I still got a heart that goes after God. It's not my credit score. That's just the head. It's not my degrees. That's just the head. I love my pastor. God knows I do. But that's just the head. If I lose everything, he placed within me the ability. Somebody lay hands on your belly and say multiply, 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 multiply. Oh, you thought I was praising God because of the hedge. And then COVID-19 hit the whole earth. But what God put in Job is what God put in all of us. And that's the ability to multiply. Even after a season of division, after a season of confusion, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praises shall be in my mouth and you'll never become what God wants you to be if you're staying in the dirt and you're staying in the hiding but you gotta come out today come out of that dirt today there are books in you that haven't been written yet there are businesses in you that haven't been started yet there are songs in you that haven't been written yet there are strategies in you locked up inside of you but you're gonna have to get your gift out of the dirt to become what God wants you to become in multiplication there are two things being multiplied and they're called factors and what's resulting is called a product and you may say I had too many negative things to take place in my life to want to multiply. I told you I can't do math, but I do know a little bit. And if you take two negative factors and multiply them together, you'll get a positive product. I need you to take what felt negative in your life and put a praise on it. It was negative. It was negative, but I'm going to multiply it. Paul was in prison, but he had to multiply it against the thorn in his flesh. And he multiplied it, and he birthed out the epistles. Hannah had to take her barrenness and multiply it by her humiliation from Penina until it pushed her into a place called Shiloh until she birthed Samuel, which means heard by God. Pastor Brady had to lose Kay, and six months later, lose her mother to turn around and multiply it. Somebody do the Wakanda. Multiply it into Kay's way. It multiplied. Job took all of his losses, everything he lost, everything, 
that the devil thought that he stole from Job. God gave it back. God gave it back. And I came to prophesy to about 200 people. God's going to give it back. We're moving forward. We're moving forward. I lost some things over the last two years, but everything I lost, God's gonna give it back. God's gonna give it back. God's gonna get to give it. God's gonna get to give it. Give it. It's gonna give it back. Somebody say it. Yeah. Somebody say it. Yeah. Oh. I'm multiplying. I'm multiplying. I'm multiplying. Baby's kid said, We don't die. We multiply. There's more in me than meets the eye. You may have seen me crying in my last season. You may have seen me broken in my last season. You may have seen me hurting in my last season. But I, 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 I'm about to multiply. I'm about to get this dirt off of my gift. Clean your shoulders. Get that dirt from the last season. That dirt of depression. That dirt of sickness. That dirt of negativity. That dirt of low self-esteem. That dirt that said, they said I wouldn't make it. They said I wouldn't be here today. They said I wouldn't amount to anything. But I'm still, I'm still, I'm still, yes I am, yes I am, I'm building my hope on things eternal, I'm still holding on, that's why I praise him, cause he didn't let go, when I felt like letting go, he held on to me. When I let go of myself, he held on in the middle of crisis. He held on in the middle of calamity. He walks with me. He talks with me. Ah! Tell me I'm his own. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou Thou, 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 God, Jehovah, Rapha, Jehovah, Jireh, Jehovah, Shama, Jehovah, Shishkanu, thou art with me. Get, come on out of the dirt. Get your praise out of the dirt. We're moving forward. Get your worship up. Get your prayer life up. Up, 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 up. Up, 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 up. All we do is win. Let me hear the sound of praise with no dirt on it. Come on. Who shall ascend? Come on, get them clean hands up. Ah. He kept me in my dirty season until I got myself together. Handololobokosataya. Now I can worship you freely. Now I can give you my whole heart again. I don't have to kill myself or my potential. Woo. 
I deserve the season that I'm living in right now. I deserve the favor that I'm walking in right now. And it's not because I've been good. It's just your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. I want to thank you. And praise you too. Oh, your grace and mercy brought me through. Your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. I gotta say it like Paul, but I. And praise you too. Because of your grace and mercy. 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 It brought me through. It brought me through. Grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living. 